Good morning and welcome to Kalapriya and our signature Cultural Sundays program. My name is Mridu Shekhar and I'm a physicist by education and currently the president of the board of the Kalapriya Foundation. Kalapriya's mission is to promote the importance and value of diversity. The foundation's mission as ad adopted in 2019 states, Kalapriya Foundation Center for the Indian Performing Arts presents India's artistic diversity through the performing arts of music, dance, theater, and storytelling, and preserve traditional South Asian art forms that build bridges between the performing arts and our co contemporary lives. Culture Sundays was launched to create a community of people interested in learning about and sharing the various aspects of Indian culture and finding relevance from global cultures to our contemporary lives. When we use the word India, we usually refer to the subcontinent, which now consists of eight different political entities. They bring a common culture with many diverse influences. The Cultural Sundays program is free to all, but we do need your support to continue this important work. Any amount will help us. You can find the link in, to make a donation on the chat box. Today, we are remembering August 1947. This time is being remembered through colonial and contemporary art and personal histories. Art historians and curators, Dr. Siddharth Shah and Zehra Jumaboy, weave their post-World War II period in South Asian art through the art of South Asia and produced by South Asians. This is art created as the British started to dismantle colonialism and several new countries emerged. Over a decade, physicist Dr. Gunita Singh Bala, who herself was moved by the stories from her village, started to record these oral histories as told by the few remaining people who experienced the trauma of this period. In 2019, 2009, I'm sorry, she created the 1947 partition archives. After their individual presentations, the three will have a discussion and take your questions to produce a robust and wholesome understanding of this period. Every August, we have celebrated the end of colonialism and the creation of new nations with marches and flags being hoisted. This year, we want to remember the art and personal experiences. We want to remember the struggles of those people who were part of this important period in our shared history. Dr. Balla has correct, collected stories from 17 different countries. 75 years later, we still debate this important history, hoping to heal and start a new period of peace. The Radcliffe Line is the boundary between Indian and Pakistani portions, primarily of the Punjab and Bengal. Named after its architect, Sir Cyril Radcliffe, and announced on the 17th of August, 1947, just a few days after India and Pakistan acquired independence from British rule, the Radcliffe Line generated violent upheavals in, as millions migrated across, in haste across the new borders. Based on works in the new South Asian galleries at the Peabody Essex Museum, this program traces the impact of the line in modern art on both sides of the border. Through drawing the line connecting the circle partition in South Asian art, we discuss how seemingly abstract motifs, zigzagging diagonals, split circles, and bifurcated triangles serve as visual metaphors for the pain, for the painful parting of the ways on one hand and for the birth of fledgling nations on the other. Dr. Shah, Jumaboy, and Bhalla will share the vision to set the stage from both sides of this line. They will start a conversation, a conversation which they hope you will join with your questions and comments to create a better understanding of the time. This presentation is being recorded and will be made available to you free of charge to view through our website and share as you start your own dialogues in your own communities. I now turn it over to the presenters. So with that, I give it to you, Gunita. I'm really amazed at your uh, perseverance in making this happen. 
Sure thing, sure thing. So I just uh, shared my screen. I've got a little presentation um, that I can share. Let's just assume that the audience has some basic knowledge of what happened in 1947 in terms of, um, you know, the uh, subcontinent with British India getting merged, uh, you know, with the indigenous kingdoms. There was over 500 of them. They were merged together, um, many of them, you know, going into 1948, even later. Uh, sometimes by force, sometimes uh, by, you know, uh, by their own volition, um, and to create these two new countries, India and Pakistan. And there were, you know, many, many, many interesting reasons for that. There's a lot of new literature um, and research coming out about that. But what I'm going to focus on today are the lived memories of people who actually went through this event. And since, um, you know, in South Asia, our archives, our history, uh, we were a colonized area and our archives were built by colonizers. And so uh, there's a huge gap between the official history and what the people actually remember going through. And when there's that big gap, it actually creates a distrust in the official history because what the people experienced doesn't match up with what is being told to them as, hey, this is what actually happened. Um, and so, uh, you know, I experienced that growing up, like I, um, my education in school, what I learned about partition growing up in India, and then when I moved to the United States, what I learned about it here, um, it was very, very different than what I learned about it through my family. And so I realized that there is this like untold history um, that needs to come out. And that's what this uh, little presentation is about. Um, and, you know, uh, just to kind of um, hone in on the importance of storytelling, Today, you know, Holocaust is one of the best uh, known histories of, of you know, post-World War or just World War II histories in the world. And it's in part because we have thousands and tens of thousands of oral histories. So we understand what happened because of the people's memories. The, um, we have an idea of dictatorships. We understand about genocides thanks to all the um, learnings that came out of the thousands of oral histories from the Holocaust. And similarly with Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we have today an understanding of what the atomic bomb can do to human civilization because we have the witness accounts. And without that, we wouldn't have had the, um, you know, the non nuclear non-proliferation movement that we have today. And we wouldn't have an understanding of the devastation of the atomic bomb that we have today. Uh, but thanks to Hiroshima, we do. And you know, here, we've got the world's uh, largest mass refugee crisis. Nearly 1% of the world's population became refugees in 47. 14% um, of the world's population was directly impacted in that either, even if they didn't migrate, people in their towns uh, left or new people came in and their you know, cities and villages completely transformed. Um, so it impacted, you know, 14%, one in eight people in the world. So very, very dramatic event that hasn't really um, enjoyed the sort of documentation that other events have. So we wanted to change this. Uh, what we did is we, um, in 2010, we started crowdsourcing. Um, and, you know, I was at Berkeley at the physics department and we were, uh, that department, there were some scientists using crowdsourcing for protein folding, different story. We decided to use the same concept um, to document um, oral history. And so we started teaching free classes, which we, we still teach, and it's been a decade. Every two weeks, we teach a free oral history workshop online. Um, loads of people sign up, they record these stories, they send them to us and we share them. So they get shared widely on social media millions of times um, now over the decade. And um, that has completely transformed partition going from a forgotten memory that nobody was thinking about to something that now even, um, you know, very senior politicians, artists, everybody is talking about. Uh, so I believe we have helped make that change. And it's uh, all thanks and due to citizen historians. So ordinary people who've come together um, to start documenting stories in their families, in their communities, wherever they are in the world, if there are partition witnesses. And these stories, of course, get preserved in a digital cloud. So the archive does not have a location. Um, it is based everywhere. Um, so I'm just going to give you guys quick glimpses into the uh, kind of work that's in the partition archive. So 
this is uh, this is me in the center here in the black. Um, and uh, this is us in Amritsar when we first started recording in 2010. Uh, we literally um, just stayed in the walled city and we went shop to shop and it was absolutely fascinating. Like this particular shop, for instance, um, had been there for like 300 years in the same family. So very, very ancient history is just, you know, uh, just getting discovered in that manner. And so we went shop to shop, found partition witnesses, people to interview, learned about what happened. And it was just an amazing experience. Um, and uh, in that way, um, you know, citizen historians, 750, more than 750 citizen historians have volunteered, come together and uh, add to that a few hundred others who volunteered to archive, who volunteered to curate and, you know, done a lot of other volunteer activities to build this archive. So, so far we've documented um, 9,700 oral histories from 17 countries, 550 villages and 36 languages with over a million people following them on social media and getting shared tens of millions of times. So really changing the conversation at the grassroots level. And now we're starting to see it in sort of the more um, mainstream parts of society. And our goal was to document 10,000 stories in 10 years. Uh, we're at the 10 year mark and we're almost there. We got a little uh, slowed down because of the pandemic. Um, so to give you some more glimpses out of the archive, so here in the Sundarbans uh, mangrove forests in um, uh, West Bengal, right on the right across from Bangladesh, actually, there's just where this island is. There's literally just a little river that separates um, them from Bangladesh in the Gosaba area. Um, so we learned some fascinating details about the history there, about how the refugees were settled in that area. This man being interviewed is 108 years old, and his son uh, sitting next to him with a head full of black hair, not dyed, <laughs> he's, he's 85 years old. Um, so really fascinating histories there. Um, he talks about how uh, this area of the Sundarbans, uh, you know, people who were given the land there, even the ind indigenous people would not take that land uh, because it was considered infertile. It was, uh, you know, in the flood zone. Um, and so those same people that were settled there uh, are now becoming climate refugees and are leaving in mass. However, um, the people that were settled there were people who were sort of, uh, you know, lower economic rungs of society. Um, they were not given land in Kolkata and some of the better areas, more fertile areas. Uh, and instead they were given land here. That's led to a lot of sort of a regional turmoil that um, you may have heard of. Um, but it's also led to really interesting social issues, for example, there's the tiger widow issue. Um, what happens is a lot of people who moved to this area, they were not accustomed to dealing with the local environment, such as the wildlife, the tigers and the crocodiles. So when um, you know, the men would go out uh, to hunt and to you know, fish, uh, a lot of times they would get attacked. And when they, the women would lose their husbands, they had no way of earning a living. Um, and so they would become so-called tiger widows and dependent on the state and so there was a lot of sort of um, social issues arising from that as well. And then we learned some really fascinating things. Like for example, I always thought chai was a staple drink of South Asia. Um, however, this gentleman who was 107 years old and he was a tailor um, his whole life and including you know, at this age of 107 when we interviewed him, um, unfortunately he's no more now, uh, but he told us how in the 1920s, um, he and his fellow villagers avoided tea like the plague and nobody drank chai. And in fact, they were uh, rumors that the East India Company was going around spiking people's milks at night when they slept to get people addicted to chai. Um, so there was a huge boycott on chai going on in his area. And he still to this day does not drink chai, though uh, we can, I think, safely say that chai ultimately won out. Um, despite these boycotts from back then. But this is something really fascinating for us to know given how fundamental or how basic chai has become in our diets. Uh, other things we learned, for example, the complete destruction of culture in you know, north, uh, northern um, parts of South Asia, Pakistan, Northern India, um, Bangladesh. Um, so especially in Punjab, uh, you know, where the violence was some of the worst, um, you had like a lot of the musical gharanas just ceased to exist when a lot of the musicians moved out of their area, were forced to move 
when they went to their new areas, their musical forms were not accepted and they ended up becoming laborers and doing really menial jobs. And their children, of course, never picked up the art. So you had almost a complete destruction of a lot of musical traditions that had been around for you know hundreds, thousands of years. Um, uh, we, there's disappearing languages that appear in the archives. So what happened is in a lot of regions where huge chunks of the population moved and you had very few speakers left, like for example, in this area, he's from um, the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa area of um, Pakistan, there's a language called Torwali. And um, you know, when a lot of speakers of these languages leave, leaving behind very few speakers, um, there's a lot of pressure for, for those speakers also to conform into whatever the other dominant languages are in the area. And of course, the people who migrate pick up the languages of where they move to and their next generation completely forgets um, you know, their parents' language. Um, then there's also fascinating stories about, for example, the ancient South Asian Jewish community that's almost 2000 years old. Um, in this case, this gentleman, I believe is the Bene Israel community. Um, a lot of these young boys, so a lot of people who moved, um, migrated from Karachi and Lahore, Jewish families to Pune in 1947. In 1948, the young boys, young teenage boys out of these families were recruited to move to kibbutzes, uh, to these different kibbutz in Israel to join the builders movement. And that was to build a new country. Um, so a lot of them went there and eventually of course ended up in New York where this interview is happening um, by one of our uh, volunteers on the left, um, who's actually now, um, she did a lot of work on partition with us and is now uh, in Chicago in Urbana-Champaign. She um, is an assistant professor there. Um, um, in any case, uh, there are some really fascinating histories there. Um, I also wanted to bring up this you know, map. Um, so there's this very dominant narrative of, there was this one big happy India and uh, when the British left, they divided it into two countries, absolutely false. Um, we had more than 500 um, indigenous kingdoms, uh, many of them in protectorate treaties with the British or the equivalent of modern protectorate pr uh, treaties. Uh, but they were independently governed. Um, they were independent entities, sort of like you know Japan and the U.S. today. Japan is not a part of the U.S., even though it's a protectorate. Um, and they had their own cultures and their whole uh, their own allegiances. And uh, many of these kingdoms, um, you know, were uh, many of them by choice, but many of them by force, even by military force, were merged into um, you know merged together with British India. The British India here is the light pink areas. Uh, the kingdoms are the darker areas. They were merged together to form um, India and Pakistan. So you didn't have, you know, this one big beautiful India that was divided. You actually had a forceful merging of numerous hundreds and hundreds of indigenous entities to create India and Pakistan. Remember that India is not even an indigenous word. Um, this word actually um, is a European origin uh, word. And uh, so you learn, you know, there's a lot of really, really fascinating histories that are hundreds and in some cases, thousands of years old, like in Jodhpur. Um, and these histories, these political histories of the subcontinent have been brushed under the carpet. Um, and, you know, we were losing a lot of culture in that way. Many of, we have stories of many libraries of these um, you know, various kingdoms being burnt after partition. And that's really sad because they had one of a kind manuscripts. So a huge loss of knowledge. Um, if you go to our website, uh, you know, hundreds of people have contributed oral histories. You can click on a city, you can look at migration paths, you can click on stories. Um, and then you can, um, if we have a video up, uh, you can watch the video. Otherwise you can see photographs and at least an abstract of the oral history. Um, there is a ton to learn from oral histories because uh, we have barely scratched the surface on partition. Right now, you know, at least our organization is in documentation phase and there is just so much that hasn't been written yet even anywhere um, that you will find in the oral histories. I'll just give you one little uh, glimpse into the violence, something that we're um, looking into just ourselves. Um, what we're finding, you know, all the oral historians who are out there recording these stories, we're finding something really interesting, like the dominant narrative we've grown up learning is that neighbors started killing neighbors. People started killing each other um, when this happened, but that is not exactly what happened. Most people were decent people and they didn't kill anyone. And people say that those who attacked them 
in most cases, they did not recognize them. Although in some cases, of course, you know, if neighbors held grudges against each other, this became a time to take revenge and things like that also happened. But in a vast majority of cases, people did not recognize their attackers and we interviewed attackers as well. And they described their primary motivation being loot or um, you know, kidnapping women and getting um, a wife, maybe somebody who was a higher class, higher social class than them that they would not have been able to uh, under normal circumstances. Um, and uh, we also, we, we hear about them attacking villages a few villages away where they didn't recognize the people. So you, you, see, you start to see that this, it was not a personal sort of thing where people just started killing each other. It was more economically driven. Um, you know, most of these mobs were driven by uh, the prospect of loot. And that loot unfortunately included um, kidnapping women and also children for um, labor. Um, complete breakdown in civil society occurred during this you know, botched transfer of power. It kind of reminds me, I mean, I, I watch what's happening in Afghanistan today and I'm just taken back to what I've learned so far about partition. Uh, you know, we, we are the United States, we are that occupying power that's left very, very quickly and is not worrying about what's happening to the people and it's, it's creating a mass refugee crisis over there. So very similar thing happened during partition. Um, and there's a lot of existing behavioral economic models that this type of violence can fit into, um, um, you know, if we want to understand that. Uh, other interesting things that happen uh, is, you know, as these stories spread in the communities, younger people start to become more appreciative through this um, crowdsourcing model. And they start getting really interested in their family's history and in their ancient histories. And I think that's really, really important, something that wasn't happening before as we were getting thrust into modern culture and just you know, forgetting about um, trying to learn about what actually happened in our histories. Um, lots of people um, through you know, these Facebook page, our Facebook page, for example, uh, find old families and friends from across the borders, lost families and friends. So that's been really uh, rewarding and intriguing to watch. Uh, finally, I'll show you a glimpse of this um, exhibit we did at the Mundy House Metro Station in Delhi. Um, and it was there for um, like a year and a half. Um, and what we showed were photographs of people and little excerpts of their stories of people who had migrated out of Delhi at the time of partition. And it was really intriguing. We were receiving messages on daily basis from younger people seeing these photos and being like, wow, I had no idea that such people uh, were living in my neighborhoods before you know, 1947. So this history is you know, so forgotten three generations later um, that we just have no idea. And so when we have no idea, we fill in the gaps with all sorts of made up histories that can be very politically divisive and, and which is kind of what we're seeing today. Um, uh, but you know, I, I do uh, feel that these oral histories can bring us back down to earth um, in, into a realm of you know, closer to reality of what actually happened. So this resource is built by everybody and for everybody. Um, so I, I thank you so much um, for tuning into my presentation. Um, and I just uh, you know, wanted to say to you that there is um, so much to learn uh, still from oral histories. Um, there is uh, just so much to learn in partition. And I hope that you, know, you will go into understanding this history with a critical mindset um, uh, because I think we, the version of history that we have is a bit divisive, not only divisive, but it's kind of pretty far away from the reality. So there's just still a lot to learn. So with this, I'm gonna turn the mic back over to Mridu because I feel, uh, I, I believe that we are ready to move on to the next speaker. Uh, I Thank you very much, Gunita. And I actually, you have picked up my curiosity and I've started to get more interested in stories. And I find a lot of stories within my own family, which I didn't know existed, which you have recorded. So Amazing. it's coming back full circle almost, you know. And with that, I want to turn it over to the art historians who look at the history of the time through the art of the people who created that art who lived through those times or who have subsequently understood that history. And I'm going to turn it over to Siddharth and uh, Zehra who have uh, worked together before. And with that, I turn it over to you, Siddharth. 
Thank you so much, Mudhu, and good morning, everybody. Um, but it really is a pleasure to be uh, presenting this material in this wonderful context and conversation. So I want to start with a quick introduction to the Peabody Essex Museum, where I work. It is the oldest continually running museum in the United States, established in 1799 as the East India Marine Society. And so when we think of most museums outside of the, beyond the subcontinent that have South Asian collections, they tend to follow the same kind of trajectory, beginning with prehistoric art, going to early Buddhist, early Hindu, and then going to maybe Mughal or Rajput paintings as if history stops um, in the 1700s. But we are not a museum that has any of that kind of material. We actually have the kinds of objects that sailors and merchants uh, leaving, the, leaving the new United States and traveling around the world were bringing back. And what started as this simple East India Marine Society has now grown to be an immense museum in Salem, Massachusetts. That includes this massive structure you see here, over 20 historic properties and a massive collection center about 30 or 40 minutes outside of Salem. And um, in presenting this material, not only do we have works from the 18th and 19th centuries, but we also have the largest and most important collection of post-independence Indian art. Um, outside the subcontinent, which is the Chester and Davida Hurwitz collection. And what I wanted to do was to show uh, a contrast between one gallery devoted to India under colonial occupation and then the gallery of post-independence work. And this gallery of historic material opens with a face-off between the goddess Kali on the right and this figure on the left, which many might recognize as the Rani of Jhansi, uh, but is actually annotated, marked Queen Victoria underneath it. So it's a face-off between these two strong female figures that I really think um, encapsulates Bengal in the 19th century. And rather than shying away from this very, very problematic material that we have in our collections, I wanted to put it front and center to show the ways in which Indians under British rule were classified. The vast diversity of the subcontinents, um, different populations and communities were reduced to things like what you see in this photograph, a figure who is named and then listed by occupation, religion, and location. And that this is how the British um, kind of dealt with, with India. They were so overwhelmed by all of these different peoples and religions and languages that they resorted to this very 19th century system of classifying Indian people as they would uh, flora and fauna, the way that insects and butterflies or plants were categorized. So they did with the people of India. And on the right, you see these mica paintings that again are showing Indians in different occupations. And this then extends into several hundred clay figures we have. Unfired clay figures that show, uh, again, the vast diversity of India, but largely through occupations, including beggars. So these are tropes of India that many still have today, but that I was trying to show were established hundreds of years ago. And I think it's ironic that even today, so many South Asians will speak of others or even themselves based on occupations. So myself, I mean, in the 80s and 90s, it was just assumed that I would become either a physician, an engineer, or you know, today it would be to work in IT. Um, so to be an art historian was completely outside of anybody's understanding of what was possible for me as an Indian American born and raised in Illinois. But moving into the, the modern work, which is really the focus um, of our conversation today, there is this object on the right and this photograph of Gandhi uh, that, are, that are positioned as transitional objects. Where on the right, we see this 19th century clay figure of a woman spinning at her charka, which was perceived as this quite archaic method of making textiles, but that Gandhi actually um, appropriates, claims this, this ancient technique to be literally a tool for revolution, that the Indians should not buy their fabrics from the British, but should rather make them themselves. And what we have in the background as people move from this historic gallery into the modern is the hymn Abide With Me, which apparently is quite controversial today in India, but something brought by the British, but that Gandhi quite loved himself. So we have this colonial fanfare playing as folks walk from that historic gallery into this massive opening into post-1947 India. It opens with this very famous quote by Rabindranath Tagore, 
let my country awake. Words that are as, to me personally, as relevant today as they were when he first wrote them. And with these words is this moment where visitors enter and are confronted by these two works that in one glance signify the moment of partition. On the left, a painting by M.F. Hussein of the British Raj, the British and Indians coexisting, where you have this Maratha king who literally does not have legs to stand on, uh, paired with Taya Mehta's uh, untitled diagonal. This line or gash or wound that cuts across the subcontinent with the Radcliffe line, but also the severing of limbs that took place um, in the violence that Gunita was speaking about earlier. And I shift here, you know, there's so much to go through. There's over a hundred works on view uh, in these spaces. But to say that, um, the heart of this collection, the first objects were M.F. Hussein's series on the Mahabharata, painted in 1971 for the Sao Paulo Biennale. This was a 29 painting series that he did and the Chester and Davida Hurwitz purchased 11 of them in Paris, actually in 1973. So how do we show Americans what the Mahabharata is when it's the longest and most complicated epic in human history? So we commissioned a four minute animated video to just kind of go over the key aspects of the story so that visitors would understand that the myth, which is about cousins born of the same blood fighting against each other, how that was used as a metaphor to speak about partition. So if you look on the floor in the distance, you will see a light projected on the floor. It's very hard to see, but um, that is Taya Mehta's diagonal, which we saw earlier, projected onto the floor to kind of reiterate this wound of 1947 that has not healed. And what is important to know is these paintings were done in 1971. So the partition, we often think of 1947, but of course that gash of 47 doesn't even have a moment to heal before that wound is reopened with the second partition. So these paintings were done in 1971. And right now here, we're looking at a painting that I believe uh, Zara will be speaking about um, soon, is a painting called Ganga and Jamuna painted by Hussein. Now he shows the two river goddesses as if they're sharing one body where that dividing line again has these bodies splitting in opposite directions. But it's important to note that the figure on the right, Jamuna, the dark river goddess, holds a broken red circle. And since we're talking about the line and the circle, that red circle against that green background is the flag of Bangladesh. Now, Bangladesh is not yet a country in 1971, but the, the, you know, the tensions have already started mounting. And if you look, the liberation flag at that moment was this red circle against the green backdrop with a map of the, of the land uh, in yellow in the center. And again, you see here the broken circle, the line that cuts through this black circle. This is a painting called um, Arjun Duryodhan Split. And the circle is broken. But what's fascinating about Hussein's work, so this is inspired by Picasso's Guernica, which he said in an interview, is his connections to European art or his awareness of it. If you were to attach those circles, bring the circle back together again, the hand that is pointing up would drop and it would be the birth of Adam from um, Michelangelo Sistine Chapel. So, so rounding the visitor in this epic of the battle then guides them into a moment of the, the journey of the nation coming into itself. And we lead with this painting of Gandhiji from 1972 with this quote, in a gentle way you can shake the world. But again, I want to draw your attention to Gandhi's hand, that walking stick that cuts through his hand where the two pieces don't even meet. So again, we have, this is from 1972, the second partition and the line being used to show that tension and that, and that trauma. So from here, we go into the process of building a new nation, this impulse to construct a new India but that impulse to, to build and grow and pursue success has actually had tremendous ramifications on the environment. And what you cannot see, you can see those three paintings in the distance is on that wall on the far, far left there. 
is an area of the gallery devoted to the Nehruvian vision of unity and diversity. As Gunita was explaining so beautifully that this was this new nation, but it was bringing together so many people who did not speak the same languages, have the same dreams, worship in the same way. And so what was that going to be like to, to unify under one new India? So that whole section is artists' works where they're um, kind of nostalgic visions of their countries or regions of origin, I should say. So you've got paintings from Bengal, a beautiful painting of a Parsi family by Bhuvan Kakkar, and um, visions of the Telangana culture by Totavai Kuntam and K. Lakshmagaud. And then following that is something that I hope resonates with American visitors as, met, as well as the South Asians, because we share a, a common challenge. It is the diversity of our country that makes it so unique and special, but it's that diversity that has been the biggest challenge to a truly harmonious and peaceful nation. And so we go here into an area of, that shows paintings by Nalini Malani of communal violence, an installation by Vivan Sundaram that commemorates, uh, it kind of honors and enshrouds an anonymous corpse um, from the riots in Bombay in 1992. But I want to here turn and move towards the circle that we're talking about in addition to that dividing line where some have emphasized the differences in people, particularly in, in religions, there were other artists who really wanted to speak about the universality of human experience, including this human trauma of the subcontinent. And rather than using a line to show division, they turned to the circle to show unity. So we've got works here by Reza, for example, on the left, and then phenomenal collection of works by Biren Day, where he is repeatedly using the circle to show um, kind of a resolution or a oneness. And a section here devoted to just, it's really to, the gallery has a lot of works and can be quite overwhelming to visitors. So we have a moment here for, for calm and peace and contemplation with two works by Gulam Rasul Santosh paired next to each other, where this mindfulness activity is, actually has a bit of a racial um, undertone to it. We're, we're asking visitors to look at one painting that is predominantly black and another that is predominantly white and to think about the associations they may already have, such as, for example, black or dark being negative and white or light being positive but then to actually start flipping those or questioning or challenging those associations. Can black be expansive? And can white be so bright that it constricts your vision? And actually in the context of what we're talking about today, Gulam Rasul Santosh is a perfect example of a Kashmiri artist um, born in a Muslim family who marries his childhood sweetheart who was a Kashmiri Pandit, a Hindu, and then takes on her name. So he himself embodied a kind of, um, returning to wholeness rather than division. And his works are also um, conveying the, the same message. And then we closed with an area um, devoted to both women revolutionaries, revolutionary women as subjects, like a painting of Pulandevi, the bandit queen, and as artists, artists like Ray Covered with Tia Nalini Malani. And then a section devoted to India's relationship with the world, where the Mahabharata comes back as a coda in this work by M.F. Hussein, painted in New York in 1990. And before we kind of resolve here, and I shift it to Zara because really ultimately our works, our uh, presentations are in conversation. I wanna draw your attention to that line of the bow and arrow. There's a bow that cuts through the center of the canvas dividing the works into, and you'll see in the top left, Ganga Jamuna two opposed, um, Ganesh and Vyasa opposed here, the horses opposed, these contrasting figures divided and splitting in two, a line that divides the, the surface of the work, but then this metaphor of the circle, the wheel that is at the center that keeps on turning and the wheel next to the figure of Karna. So that while this dividing line has um, you know, marked the subcontinent, that wheel that is on the flag of India, it actually still needs to be turning and this conversation still needs to be evolving. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Zara Jumaboy, and encourage um, all of you to put questions into the Q&A box so that we can address them together. 
So I'm going to stop sharing and hand it over to my friend and colleague, Zara Juma Boy. Thanks for that. That was, that was amazing. And I, I actually really love the way we started as well with sort of Gunita giving us a, a frame um, of some of the things that we're uh, going to sort of narrow um, in on now. So just as Gunita talked about the sort of the, the new India and the new kind of nations, Pakistan, Bangladesh, that sort of uh, are formed um, with sort of forcibly cohesive identities at this point. And then, um, you know, so that goes quite into the way in which sort of India visualizes itself. What I'm going to do is pick up one small strand of that, um, specifically looking at the idea of the circle um, and the sort of split circle, the triangle, um, but most importantly, this sort of line of division. Um, and sort of watch how they kind of ricochet across the work of uh, modern Indian art, um, but also uh, modern Pakistani art. And I have to sort of uh, bear you, a, a kind of ask for your indulgence when it comes to me talking about Pakistani art, because this is just like a sort of a new conversation that both Siddharth and I have started with a scholar called um, Dr. Samina Iqbal, um, who is a Pakistani art historian, also looking at this um, material. Um, and uh, we're sort of very much in conversation with um, uh, people like Sitemur Hassan, who's a collector in London, who's collecting both Indian and Pakistani art. And the way in which we um, are constructing our dialogues is, is very research-based on um, seeing these, uh, these sort of artworks in, from India and Pakistan together um, for actually the first time. Um, and so this is a very live conversation of work that is still very, very much being done. So what I'm giving you today is just like a very small sort of um, tentative strand of explorations, let's say. So this is a sort of close up um, of a Hussein painting that I will show you. And it's called Splitting the Difference because I like my metaphors. Um, and of course, metaphors here and this idea of the split is very, very um, a sort of central, pivotal um, to what we're going to be looking at. So just to take you uh, back for a second, this is the Radcliffe line that we're talking about, partition 1947. There's, uh, I mean, the, the focus uh, on today is very much that 1947 partition. Um, and I, Again, I have to beg your indulgence a little bit uh, because I realized that this 1947 partition um, is got two elements to it. And one of them is of course the formation of what became East Pakistan at that point, later Bangladesh. And of course the sort of uh, West Pakistan, which is now what we call um, which is, which remains uh, Pakistan. And of course the Radcliffe line is a line drawn as we know by Cyril Radcliffe. Um, it was as um, Ridu sort of um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, talked about a line um, that was sort of, uh, was drawn and actually the partition line was announced on the 17th of August. Um, and this is, days after um, the independence. And of course, what that immediately sort of uh, tells us is that there's going to be panic and uh, hysteria because this line is basically announced um, not before independence, but after. So you have people crossing in panic the new borders and where the line was actually going to come down wasn't even um, that clear before it did. So there was a great deal of panic and a great deal of trauma. And this is kind of what I am discussing today is um, trauma not not just in terms of, of, of real trauma, in terms of facts, but how this trauma then gets absorbed into um, artwork and how that art then becomes a sort of manifestation, a kind of return of, of the repressed. And I'll, I'll tell you very shortly why I'm using that phrase. So um, just to revisit, 
I uh, said so that uh, Shaw again, let my country awake is this section. And as he said, um, this is the sort of uh, an embodiment of partition in the way in which the 47 partition in the way in which it works within this show. Um, this is an exhibition that I curated called The Progressive Revolution um, at the Asia Society Museum with Tan Bun Hui. And as you will see, um, it was an exhibition dedicated to the progressive artist group. Um, and uh, many of the people I'm talking about uh, today come from this progressive artist group. Now, why is a progressive artist group so symbolic? Um, it's in, it's, they're known as India's quintessential moderns. Uh, they're the six um, male members who formed in 1947 at just after Indian independence. Um, they're a very plural group. They were they contained within themselves Christians, uh, Muslims, and in fact, the best known um, uh, artists among them, Hussein uh, Raza, were Muslim, Souza, uh, Christian, and Goan. Um, and uh, the sort of the focus uh, uh, in, in today's talk that is, is going to be on Hussein and Raza, also specifically as it as the two Muslim artists who um, are very important to forming the idea of India's secular national identity. Um, the fact that they are Muslim, but at the same time can have a hand in creating an iconography. But it is also um, with these two artists that I will argue you see the fault lines um, of the nation because they're Muslim, perhaps, um, uh, and perhaps also because the sort of the trauma of partition, this, the, this, the splits caused by partition in 1947 have real and actual ramifications, particularly for someone like Reza, whose brother is across the border in Pakistan. So the choice to stay at some level, the choice to define yourself as, as Indian is not one that is just a given. It's one that is, um, uh, 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 worked at, um, and this is also why these are these are very interesting artists to to, to look at in terms of how that trauma sort of resurfaces. Um, uh, in, in work and how sometimes this trauma is not even discussed um, as the, the trauma it really is related to. Um, and, and we're going to see that quite a bit. Um, so something that I, I kind of uh, did in this uh, um, Progressive Revolution show, and it was a one section of it, um, was a sort of re argue that a lot of the kind of formal decisions that artists uh, like a Christian Kanna, who very much belong to progressive artist group, um, but the second wave of progressive artists, so 1953, he joined. Um, and so people like Christian Kanna, this, the, this group, um, you know, made a series of choices uh, visually that have often been attributed to formal uh, reasons and to art historical reasons. Um, and my argument within the show um, was that, yes, there are formal reasons for choices, but they're also historic reasons and you can't look away from the politics. So this is one of the paintings that I kind of uh, turned into a little fulcrum as it were for that argument. And here we have Christian Kanner's The Anatomy Lesson. And of course, as we know from the title of the uh, anatomy lesson, it's a reference to Rembrandt's The Anatomy Lesson, which shows um, people bending over a body and it's being operated on. And my argument, which I, which is very much um, what I'm sort of pushing here today, and I hope you'll agree with me, is that actually the Christian Kanna anatomy lesson in 1972 what he's talking about is not just an art historical reference. These are generals standing around what looks like a piece of paper, the way they're holding it. Um, but this piece of paper, if you look very closely, actually outlines the uh, formation of a map. And I've given you the map over here. So you can see exactly, um, and you know, if anyone who knows um, uh, me and the way in which I read images, will know that I'm totally obsessed with maps. And so I see them, I 
I get um, in in lots of in lots of places maybe where maybe they don't exist. But in this case, I think there's a very good argument for saying yes, it does exist. If you look really closely um, at the very formation of this uh, the the of the Bangladesh map, you can see its outlines just in the way this is sketched. And so, of course, this anatomy lesson is really talking about the formation of Bangladesh. It's talking about the generals bent over this map. Um, and it's talking about the dismemberment of the nation. Now, dismemberment, splits, um, interrupted circles, bifurcated triangles, all of these are metaphors for partition. Um, and that is very much what I'm arguing. So I had put that particular work next to this work. Um, Daeb Mehta, again, uh, of a close associate of the progressive artist group, um, and hence included in this show. And the reason that I had put this right next door is, of course, the argument that, you know, um, there's a very uh, strong movement that reads Daeb Mehta's introduction of the diagonals in the late 60s, 70s um, as being there because he goes to New York and he's very influenced by the zip paintings like this of Bartnett Newman. And in fact, Daeb Mehta himself used to talk about the fact that the diagonal enters his work for a formal reason, because it's very influenced by Bartnett Newman's zips. Whereas my argument is that actually this is this is not totally true, and perhaps there is a sort of lack of um, uh, a deliberate sort of obfuscating of uh, of a trauma as to why why the diagonal appears. And it's interesting that in the seventies, as Siddharth hinted, um, you know the Mahabharat uh, becomes very important for both for Krishna Kanna, for Hussein, for Tayyip Mehta. Um, uh, and uh, the, the sort of the line, the bifurcating line starts to play, appear in the 70s. And so, of course, by making this connection, what I'm trying to say is that this is not a formal choice. Actually, the, bi the, 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 the line appears in, in um, Bad Meta's work because he's really talking about partition. And so he's using um, the sort of uh, the, the historical fact of the formation of, of Bangladesh, the second partition of the subcontinent, which India is very involved in sitting right in the middle as it is, um, to actually it sort of jerks a sort of primary trauma that was the first partition. And therefore, my argument is that the very line that you see appearing, the bifurcating line, is not the line that sketches um, Bangladesh. Um, it's actually the line that of the primary partition of, um, you know, the, the formation of, of, of West Pakistan at that point, that part of the Radcliffe line is what is being um, discussed. Um, and, you know, there's, again, as I said, a lot of this is, is new research. So um, there's, there has been writing on partition in the moderns. And so far, the general writing has been um, both in India and in Pakistan, that the moderns never really dealt with partition. Whereas what Siddharth, I and Samina are arguing is that yes, they did, but they didn't necessarily deal with it um, as an obvious fact, as in you wouldn't necessarily see, um, you know, refugees on a canvas. Um, but what you would see is in the 70s, and perhaps even before, as I will show you, um, a, a gesture um, uh, towards the line, towards splits. And this is a sort of bleak, metaphorical way, uh, to quote an uh, art historian called Iftikhar Dadi, um, a bleak, metaphorical way in which the trauma of partition surfaces in the paintings um, without a sort of direct reference, you know, a direct reference. And sometimes, perhaps one could even argue that the way in which these artists talk about this primary trauma is that they themselves don't let themselves um, acknowledge that this is what they're doing. And certainly this is true in the case of a Christian Kanna, who when, um, you know, often was asked about partition and whether or not he painted it, often said, mm -mm, no, I never did that. You know, you, you don't sit down and you just paint a, a, a trauma that you've just seen. And of course, Christian Kanna came from, um, you know, he was he was based in uh, uh, Lahore and he he moved because of partition. So he did witness things, but he always claimed that, you know, he never painted it. And as I'm going to show you, this is not actually true. 
Um, so another painting that was included in the uh, Progressive Revolution show, um, and here you can see very obviously this is about partition, but also about dismemberment. Um, and through the diagonal series, and here I'm just pointing out to you uh, the, the maps um, of, you know, after partition and then after 1971. Uh, and so this is the sort of uh, second partition. So the argument being that the 70s um, very much sort of reawoke uh, the, the sort of primal trauma that was partitioned and that this reawakening saw partition appear in modern artworks, but in this very oblique um, form in this metaphorical form of references to lines, of references to dismemberment, um, of references to split circles. So here you have it. Uh, this is the work that Siddharth showed us, and and which is his sort of opening to this um, to his hang. Um, and it's an it's an obvious read now as to where this is coming from. Um, also, this is the same Ganga Jamuna, which uh, Siddharth dealt with a little bit, and um, I want you to draw attention again to this sort of the colors of Bangladesh over here, because this is now where we're going with this discussion. Um, so here, as I told you, you know, Krishan Kanna from saying that I, he never really dealt with partition, if in the light of our readings of the 70s work, we go back to this uh, very early work produced in 47, which has often been written about, by the way, both of these, and they've often been written about in the context of Krishan Kanna's use of um, Pahari painting in his early work. Um, but of course, what I want to point point um, out is, of course, that yes, there, it, there's, a, there's a huge influence of Pahari painting in this work, but it's also very much uh, using those symbols that then reappear in the 70s of the line, of the splitting line, um, of, you know, curving circles that are bifurcated and interrupted. And both of these in that in the light of that reading become rather dark works. And you start noticing that the sort of split tree, the death in the afternoon, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's obviously not a happy picture and it obviously is about partition. Um, so this is the last bit before I sort of um, end. And this is the kind of research that uh, uh, Siddharth Samina Iqbal, who I mentioned before, um, and I uh, are sort of uh, conducting as it were, um, by re-looking at Indian modern art, but also now Pakistani art, um, and looking at how the sort of the, the bifurcating lines, the sort of supposedly abstract symbolism um, really references these primal splits, but also kind of how this sort of symbolism of, of the modern Indian um, uh, my, or the modern Pakistani might actually reference to might actually reference to the other across the border. And that if we acknowledge that partition was a fact, um, and if we read these images again through that knowledge, whether or not we get something a little bit different from these narrow siloed histories that separate India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Um, and of course, this is a work, 71, called Zameen, Earth, um, and it's really obvious from the colors, um, as well as from, again, these bifurcating lines, that there's a, there's a chance that this is actually talking about um, Bangladesh and referencing partition. Um, so here is this my sort of end point where I'm just going to show you a few images that um, come out of and through dialogue with Temur Hassan, who is a collector, as I said, he has a huge collection in London, where on his walls, he's creating all of these sort of dialogues. Um, and he's got quite a few of his own opinions on, on, on how these things work. And sometimes I kind of agree with them. And sometimes um, uh, I kind of um, don't, but usually I do. So one of these uh, dialogues that, that, that he's doing is, um, so here's Hussein again, progressive artist from uh, modern Indian art. And here you have Shakir Ali, who Samina Iqbal talks a lot about as being seminal to the formation 
of the progressive artist group's exact counter, which is um, the Loho Art Circle. And so on Temur's walls, these are being kind of united. And one of the reasons that you could actually uh, look at these in, in tandem and say, you know, there's a lot of uh, formal dialogue between these works is, of course, you know, the, the formation of the modern itself in, in terms of um, modern painting throughout South Asia was very influenced by and in conversation with um, Euro-American modernism um, and European modernism. And in this case, you know, Shakir Ali, uh, just like Ram Kumar in India, both studied under um, Andre Lott. So one of the formal equivalences that you could could um, sort of attribute the formal equivalences to the fact that you know there was a, there was a similar um, uh, sort of uh, training, visual training um, in uh, Euro-American um, and European modernism. But I think it goes beyond this, um, that it is, it, as I said, these are not just formal choices. And the reason for the echoes are not just a formal, uh, is, are not just formal. Um, they also have to do with historical reference points, the fact that they're all referring to South Asian traditions, but also that they are referring to South Asian histories that are deeply traumatic and finding ways of dealing with it. Um, and so these are some of the works that Temur has recently collected in this sort of line, um, one of them being Ana Mulka Ahmed, uh, is, uh, considered again, uh, Pakistani modern. And this is a work that she makes in the 70s, but um, it's a very much so 70s again, so just like Krishan Khanna and Thayat Mehta in the 70s doing that diet. Um, that method doing the diagonals and Christian kind of doing these sort of um, bifurcated maps. Um, here you have Anamoka Ahmad um, going back in the 70s to talk about partition, which she would have experienced. Um, and then this is a work that does not belong to Temur, um, but it's a really interesting work that I saw in Akbar Nakbi's book on art and identity. And again, it's by Shakir Ali. It's got a blue moon in the center again, really uh, interesting that it's a bifurcated blue moon and the way in which Akbar Nakvi is reading this blue moon, sorry for the uh, weird faint uh, image here, is actually he is talking about the fact that there's a big possibility that this bifurcated moon is actually dealing with um, the Pakistani flag drenched in red blood in the dark moon. And so, of course, is this a reference again to a uh, partition? Um, is this uh, a reference to violence? And why 1965 is really important is that, of course, uh, 1965 is the second war um, between uh, India and Pakistan. And so this kind of um, sort of a uh, moon that is uh, sliced in this way could very much be, and this really reminds me a little bit of a gun actually, uh, could very much be not a formal choice of a blue moon, but actually about blood and about um, uh, sort of the foundational dialogues, which are again being challenged because of the war. So the 60s, and of course, this is very much something that um, Temur is examining again on his walls. So he he sort of um, is very much looking at both Hussein and a modern Pakistani artist called Sadikin, um, both of whom he has on his walls. And this work, according to Temur, and I tend to agree with him here, is a 1965 work by Hussein. Again, it's got these sort of double egg figures, um, and they're sort of they're split in two. So the, the doubles um, of India and Pakistan, and again, just like, um, you know, the circle in 1965, this is exactly the same year. Um, so again, this sort of reference through doubles, through splits, through circle to this foundational trauma. Um, and of course, I would argue that a work like this by Sadikin again sort of doubles again sort of with with the sort of line in the way in which the um the the diptych works uh, could also be a reference to this kind of trauma um and 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 through these foundational traumas that don't go away in the india pakistan uh, dynamic and that it's referenced in these metaphorical ways through the art all of 
the way across the subcontinent. And this is a work that Temur has collected, which is very much about the war um, in 1965. It's a 1965 work by Sadikin. Um, so I'm going to end here um, with a work by Raza that um, is owned uh, by VM Art Gallery, but it's a Rangun Wala collection. And this is a really, really fascinating work by Raza um, because it is a work that the Rangun Wala Foundation um, is a Pakistani foundation. And it's a work, remember I said Raza and his brother were split because um, Raza's brother Ali Imam goes to Pakistan. And so this is a work ironically found, and Raza and his brother don't really talk about their artwork to each other um, too much. Um, and uh, Raza's brother Ali Imam sets up a gallery in Pakistan called the Indus, uh, in, in, the Indus Gallery. And Indus Gallery hosts a lot of the progressive artist group, including Souza, and of course it invites you know, Ali Imam invites Raza himself, and Raza never shows there. But found in um, Ali Imam's collection, which is now owned by the Rangun Bala Foundation, is this work by Raza. And what does it say? I'm just going to end with this, um, which sort of shows you this the, the kind of the, the, the primary trauma of these two brothers shadowed across the border with each other. And this is a quote embedded in the painting. Uh, from the Hindu Hindi poet uh, Madhavi Verma, it says, "Let the path be unknown and you, me, alone." So I want to ask you: It's a 1963 work. Was Raza offering an olive branch of peace to his brother, who he never really forgave for leaving um, and going across the border, as it were? Um, was it a message of forgiveness across the divides of space and time, or did his present emphasize the loneliness of an eternal separation. Perhaps, but our presence here today, I would argue, need not support such a message. We would rather join the dots, heal the slash, and connect the circle. And I'm going to pass it back to um, Ridu. Well, so much to digest. It's amazing, you know, and uh, I'm really pleased that you guys read such, such stuff into something that seems like, you know, <laughs> a piece of art which one can enjoy. Uh, I have a couple of uh, a series of questions from the audience. And if you have questions of each other, you might want to do that first. So um, I pass, pass the baton to whoever would like to ask a question of the other. If you don't, I have some questions in, from the audience that we can take. Okay, so that was your time. You can, I can let, I can. There's a gentleman called Raju Bhatt uh, who does some work in Kashmir and he has asked three questions that I'm going to lump together. Is plurality realistic for India or was India not ready to be thrust into accepting plurality? That is one question. Another question of his is, have dormant feelings of trauma been re-stimulated by accounting the story? This sort of you know, leads into what you said at the very end. I mean, he's a very perceptive young man. The last, oh my God, he's got several more questions. He's got two more questions. What is keeping India and Pakistan from moving in discussion and healing? Have Kashmiris been producing artwork to show the hardships they are going through. So these questions all, you know, we are around the art. So I would say maybe Siddhartha and uh, Zehra try to answer them. Well, I'll just start with one aspect of it, which is whether India is ready for plurality or to accept plurality. I don't really think it's a question of being ready or not or accepting or not. Plurality is the reality. It has been. I mean, I am not a monolith. To not embrace my own multiplicity or plurality or complexity is to deny myself the wholeness of who I am. And I think the same would go for, for India or the subcontinent. There's no, there's no being ready for plurality. plurality. Uh, you, just, you just have to deal with it. Zera. Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I agree with that, obviously, but I'm not really sure about um, Kashmiris and what kind of art is coming out of there now. I mean, I, I, this is something that I, I think we're all waiting to see. Uh, I mean, times of trauma invariably create art, but, you know, it, it's going to be interesting to see what does come out of it. Gunita, you have any comments on Mr. Bhatt's question? Um, sure, yeah. I, I don't remember all three of the questions now. I, I, I'm honing yes. in on the one <laughs> that we were uh, focused on. Uh, oh, go ahead. Is there anything, uh, let me ask a question differently. Uh, do you have any stories from Kashmir? Uh, of course. Yeah, because that is an area of you know partition as well that we have not specifically focused on. But you know the line didn't go through Kashmir, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, it didn't. So yes, we do have oral history. But on the question of plural plurality, I can just add that um, you know amongst the people we interview, um, I think Allison brought this. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, not Allison. Zara brought this up earlier, um, and you know. Identity is something that it took three generations to develop. The modern Indian and Pakistani identities didn't exist really before 1947. And um, so this idea of plurality also goes hand in hand with um, how these identities have developed. Because before that people had their regional identities, um, that's what we're finding. And so I think um, to understand how that identity has evolved and the issues we're having with those identities today um, and how a lot of these regions were, you know, autonomous, but now they're under this umbrella rule. So we may want to think about maybe people need, uh, maybe there needs to be more um, regional empowerment. Maybe that is the way. So those are the kinds of things that I would say about that we need to think about in terms of why that's maybe not working as well as we would like it to. And the issue of uh, bringing peace and uh, what was the common, yeah, towards discussion and healing. I think maybe Kashmir falls like <laughs> right smack in the middle of that question, right? I mean, uh, two sides of Kashmir is, are not yet d discussing and healing. Uh, here's a question from Dr. Ramnath that says, it's addressed to Gunita. It says, thanks for the presentation. This is a question for Gunita, but perhaps applies to all three speakers. I am eager to hear about a gendered analysis of the partition experience. Was there a partition or partitions within the partition experience? Did different demographics, especially men and women, recollect their experiences differently? And does this influence how they are represented in the visual arts? Uh, in terms of the visual arts, I think I'm not the right person. Uh, I think Zara and Siddharth uh, will uh, have much more to say. Uh, but in terms of you know the gendered experience, I think Urvashi Batalia has done some amazing writing on this. Uh, but what we find is, yes, uh, women are more shy when it comes to talking about it. Um, however, it seems that because women talk about it more within their immediate circles, um, they are slightly less traumatized by the, you know, events of partition when by the time we speak to them 70 years later, than um, many men who have uh, you maybe not spoken about it ever really since then. We might be the first time, uh, first people they're speaking to about this and they've kind of kept it inside. Um, and it, this trauma is suddenly coming and so sometimes you know, we have to, they want us to try coming back a number of times because it's difficult for them to um, talk about it the first time, but they really want to. And so we continue working with them with patients and try to go back a second time or a third time until, you know, they're absolutely ready to kind of bring it out. So that's kind of something we've seen that's a, a little different between the uh, male and female experiences. Women tend to not want to talk about it publicly, but when they do, it becomes clear that they have come more in terms with their trauma. Also, uh, we've met a lot of women who've converted religions in both countries. Um, they have been absolutely unwilling to go on camera and have anything recorded because they're worried that it will negatively impact their future generations if um, you know people in the community find out that they belong to a mixed family. 
Very interesting, very interesting. You know, I have often wondered whether the partition experienced by the uh, um, lower so socioeconomic levels was different from the partition experienced by the uh, you know wealthier people because they were able to either move their uh, assets or you know uh, could themselves move because you know they had choices that the lower socioeconomic uh, category did not have. It, it's not necessarily true. Um, um, a lot of wealthy people um, literally had nothing, you know, just like everybody else, had nothing, uh, didn't have more than a minute to make a decision. They just had to up and run with nothing. However, yes, there were people who were wealthy, who were in connected circles, who understood what was about to happen, and they had the opportunity to sell their assets or transfer their assets in advance. But it was definitely not true for uh, probably a majority of people. Uh, but yes, um, in terms of uh, people who, uh, you know, a lot of people who um, were not wealthy even converted their religions just to stay back. They didn't have as much to lose um, and they just converted. And so that was also happening. And at times we've also heard about people who were um, thrust into the forefront of the violence, um, you know, especially from the lower economic um, backgrounds. Zehra and uh, Siddhartha, do you want to talk to the artists themselves? Are most of the artists from your, the period that you're discussing men or women? And are their experiences in the way they have expressed themselves different? I would say most of the artists are men, uh, but not all of them. And I, I don't see a clear gender distinction in the work that they're producing. Um, maybe Zara can answer that. But the other thing I want to say real, real, real quickly is, is that if women, in terms of what Gunita was saying, like women were more hesitant to share their stories, I think if we're talking about objects, a lot of the objects that were maybe transferred in the movement, um, women's bodies were the sites of carrying a lot of this uh, in terms of like the study of objects, whether it was clothing or jewelry or coins and things like that. So I wonder if some of the objects that were transferred were possessed more by women in some cases. The little bit I've read around the object transfer is gendered. It's women are the sites of transfer of wealth. Um, but I'm sure it wasn't exclusively them and maybe Gunita can respond to that, but that's all I want to say about that. That's really interesting and I never really thought about that aspect of you know the objects being female objects. I mean what really interests me is um, you know someone like uh, Vina Das uh, who's a sociologist who Nalini Milani one of the artists um, not this generation not um, you know not not the sort of 40s 50s uh, sick uh, um, generation a, a much younger artist um, uh, who did experience partition, but as like a one-year-old child in arms, uh, her mom mm. took her across to, to Bombay. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, Nalini quotes Vina Das a lot. Um, and of course, what they're looking at is the way in which the woman's body becomes the site um, that uh, partition violence was enacted in some ways, but also how um, it's it's not it's not just the physical fact of rape or, or, or claiming that happens on the woman's body, but how in fact that the, this is facilitated because of our metaphorical and symbolic connection um, of, of India being um, a sort of mother India, right? And so the, the fact that the female body is so uh, intrinsic to the way in which Indian nationalism um, sort of comes to being or imagines itself uh, has that uh, unfortunate effect of that act of claiming um, means, you know, uh, how, how, how do you show um, that, that you're taking possession, you go and you rape the woman, um, because she isn't just, it isn't just a, a person, it's, it's a symbolic um, thing and so, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I I think there's that sense in which the woman is uh, constantly present um, in uh, sort of modern uh, uh, modern art in, in in that way, even if it's just vicariously um, that kind of claiming. Well, you know, it looks like a lot of 
if, if study needs to be undertaken, more rigorous, uh, you know, art history slash sociological mm -hmm. study needs to be undertaken. And, you know, those of the people who are here who are academics, I think may have a lot to contribute. I have another question here which says, how do you see Delhi Silpi Chakra fit into the art historical narrative that deals with partition? Formed primarily as a result of partition, which with its founders like B.C. Sanyal, P.N. Magu and others, moving from Lahore to Delhi right after partition. It's also interesting to hear that about the Lahore art circle as Delhi Silpi Chakra is simple, the Hindi version of the same name. Uh, I don't know if that was a question or comment. Seems like a comment more than a question. I think so too. There is another question here from Mr. Ms. Natasha Raheja. Thank you for this incredible panel. Loved hearing about the Mahabharata as a resource for visualizing the trauma of partition. Can you speak more broadly about the use of idioms of kinship and religious mythology in the visual archive of partition? And are there any other examples? Also in terms of maps and cut up anatomy, I was thinking about how the right wing visual of Akhand Bharat, Bharat Mata is one of dominant alternative. Do we see any progressive artists working to visualize alternatives to partition in less hegemonic ways? Well, um, I think Zara might be able to better address this than me, actually. And this is part of why I love working with her so much is because we bring our own our, our own pieces to this conversation. The Mahabharata is just the perfect metaphor for this. And I don't see other mythological references, I think, in part because this is such an ideal one, though there is in that last painting of the Mahabharata that I showed from 1990, you see Gandhari blindfolded um, sitting with her children crawling all over her, but she's sitting as if she's on top of a pyre that's burning, which kind of references the test, the trial of Sita, the trial by fire of Sita. And so I do think that there's ways in which some of these myths can be conflated into each other. Um, but I, but I think the emphasis tends to be Mabharat because the idea is again, it's born of the same blood and of the same earth turning against each other, fighting for what is right. But then in the end, neither is really a victor. There's, there's victory. What does victory even mean at the end of that battle? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I totally uh, uh, agree with that. I mean, we've obviously had this conversation before in terms of like, you know, because he knows such a lot about um, Hindu myths and has been like helping me read paintings with that knowledge um, in, in, in mind, as it were, because, you know, a lot of these artists were incredibly well versed in Hindu mythology. Um, so they, re they, they were using these very advisedly um, because they knew and um, a, a sort of the scholars almost in their own right, as it were. Um, so one needs knowledge in order to decode what, what their symbolism is. But um, there's something really interesting that Thayab Mehta does in their sort of, uh, you know, um, in 1780s also, which is his um, Maheshwasara uh, images. Um, and uh, I actually remember talking to, during the Progressive Revolution show, there was one amazing Thayab Mehta, which I had sort of ang gold uh, quite close by to these splits and these diagonals and the the sort of uh, one of the collectors actually came to see the the this Maheshwara work by Taeb. Um, and for those who don't know it it's actually uh, something he's really famous for uh, revisiting which is the battle between Durga and the uh, buffalo demon right and um what's so amazing in the way in which he does that is again he uses these sort of twisted diagonals um and the bodies of Durga and the demon are entwined and so um this kind of comes back to this question where uh the the collector involved was like 
do you know about this uh, myth and why it's actually so symbolic? Um, and I was like, well, yes, I mean, you know, this is this is a, a, a battle against good and evil. He said, it's not just a battle about good and evil. It's, it's a battle because the demon is in love with Durga and he fights her because the only way, um, she, you know, she's been invented to defeat him. And he's in the, I mean, he, he has so many boons from the gods that he's basically, he's immortal, he cannot be defeated. So what they do is they create Durga, a beautiful woman, and he falls in love with her. And so the way in which she defeats him is because she says, fight me in battle. And if I lose, then I will be your lover. So he fights her because he loves her. And this is how he dies. And so, you know, the collector turned around and he was like, actually, this is this is a metaphor, isn't it? Um, you can't tell where good starts and where evil ends. You can't still tell from the way in which that method constructs this figure, you know, which who is on which side of this battle, the bodies are entwined. You can't separate them. And it just occurred to me that actually this, this um, myth that he kind of keeps repeating repetitively going back to again like that diagonal is perhaps it's also a way of talking about the subcontinent it's again talking about sort of these these double figures who are who are split who hate each other because they love each other over reading or what i don't think so i think this happens in everyday life you know you fight with the people that you love the most uh, but, you know, there are a, quite a number of comments and questions, which I think maybe we can sort out. Uh, one of the things we're going to do is to take all the questions and comments and put them in a document and share them. And either uh, and, and all three of you will have the opportunity to respond to them, because I think we're going to run out of time. You know, we should be already. Oh, my God, it's 1132. We usually like, try to limit it to 90 minutes and uh, so uh, that, that's what we do. If, if, if any of the three of you have any closing comments, I know there's been a lot of interest in the work that you are all doing. And I just wonder if we should you know, start some kind of a fellowship or something in universities for people to undertake this kind of work. You know, this is fascinating work. And this is where actually dialogue begins. You can have a dialogue between people who are uh, you know, worried about talking about the real thing by talking about the art that's created from the real thing and the stories that come out of the real thing. And I have a completely unrelated question of Gunita. Who's that beautiful lady behind you? Um, you know, this is, uh, this is Hamida Begum. She um, is a partition migrant. She migrated from uh, Ferozpur to Chang. And this is just uh, leftover. We had converted our office into a pop-up museum uh, right before the pandemic um, in 2019 late 2019, so it's leftover from that time. <laughs> so it's behind my desk. Well, it's beautiful. And it's a great backdrop for any Zoom events or <laughs> any yeah. online. Events. Yeah, it just kind of um, happened that way. <laughs> <laughs> That's and, and, yeah. and, you know, uh, I want to do a shout out to Zehra's project. Uh, go to her website and please take a look at, uh, you know, that. Uh, uh, there's been some you know, I think that uh, most of you would be probably excited as I was to go to uh, Salem and actually meet uh, Siddhartha. We took a detour from Boston and uh, took a day to go visit this visit his museum, which is amazing. You know, sitting sitting in Salem, Massachusetts, you wouldn't think that there's such a major body of work would be resident. And the art from the way the col colonists represented us is very, very moving you know, people with one eye and, you know, this, this, that, that stuff is, uh, thank you very much to all of you. And I want to uh, tell you that, you know, C Cultural Sundays continues. I don't know if you guys have any statements to make about your work or about anything. And then we'll turn it over to the next program. Siddhartha? I would just like to say thank you for having us. Oh, it's been such a joy. And we had a lot more people registered, but many of them know that we will be posting it by the end of this week. 
We'll have the YouTube up by the end of this week. You can access it through our website or you can access it by just searching on YouTube. <laughs> and we will send the link to all the people who have registered. So, you know, there's probably 125, she said. So uh, thank you very much and keep the energy up and get the, keep the work going. And with that, Alison, the, uh, the uh, floor is yours. Many, many congratulations coming through on the chat and on the q &A. <laughs> Thank you very much. This has been wonderful. Thank you guys for joining us and we'll see you next month. Um, and um, we, we posted up the, um, the slide for next month's event, the Sufi Gospel Project. Um, we're gonna be having a discussion with the, the founder and she's gonna be doing some, some songs for us. So we hope you'll join us and um, have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you.